Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you. I'm Rhonda jones and chair of our uh, division training committee. Uh, this in-service uh, seminar is sponsored by our division training committee. And uh, that committee oversees all the training programs uh, in the division and includes uh, all the program directors, our student services staff, and then student representatives. And we work very hard to make sure we provide the best experience for our students as, as well as faculty. So I'm going to have uh, Evan, who is a director of our student uh, services and academic affairs, introduce our speaker. Thanks, Rhonda, and happy Friday to everyone. Thanks for those that are joining us in person today and everyone that's on Zoom as well. Um, right now, it looks like we have about 10 folks joining us on Zoom and a similar-ish number here in person for those on Zoom who can't see. Um, there'll be a couple of opportunities during our session today for um, engagement where our presenter, Katie, might be asking questions. Um, so for those of you on Zoom, please feel free to respond to those questions in the chat. For folks that are in the room, uh, we're hoping to be able to have some uh, engagement and interaction with that as well. And towards the end of the session, there'll be an opportunity for some smaller group discussions, and we'll be planning to have those both in person here as well as through um, some breakout rooms in the Zoom platform as well. So we have a couple of different ways that we'll manage the two spaces that we're in. Um, so I have the privilege this morning of introducing our speaker, um, Katie Kuhnmeiners. She is the Associate Director in the Office for Community Standards here at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, Katie has been with the university since 2008, where she started as an undergraduate academic advisor in the College of Liberal Arts. While in that college, Katie enjoyed a joint appointment in the Center for Academic Planning and Exploration, which is known as CAPE, where she coached undergraduate students in exploring and reaching their academic and career goals. After leaving CLA in 2017, Katie briefly worked for the College of Education, Human, and Human Development, where she advised students and worked with faculty in the School of Physiology. Katie joined the Office for Community Standards as the Associate Director in December of 2018. In her current role, Katie and the OCS Director are responsible for adjudicating all student conduct code violations on the Twin Cities campus. She also directs the Academic Integrity Matters AIM program, which is a restorative justice program for first-time violations of scholastic dishonesty. Katie earned her undergraduate degree in political science from the College of St. Benedict in 2003, and a Master's of Education in Student Development at Seattle University in 2008. She's currently pursuing a PhD in Organizational Leadership Policy and Development in the Higher Education Track here at the University of Minnesota. So let's give a warm welcome and round of applause for Katie. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you again for having me here. Um, so like Evan said, my name is Katie Koopminers. I am the Associate Director in the Office for Community Standards. Um, we are located over on the East Bank in Appleby Hall. Um, so if you ever get a chance to come over to the East Bank and want to pop in and say hi or want to do a consult, we are more than welcome to um, with you. So before we get started, um, just want you to think a little bit about, um, you know, here at the university, maybe you feel like you might not be making a difference, that maybe you're just one of many in a giant ocean. I know this is a huge university, which sometimes definitely seems that way. So maybe you feel a little bit like this. Or do you ever think, why does everything at the university have to be so complicated? Why can't we just go from point A to point B? Why is there all of this stuff that has to be done in order to get there? Sorry, 
So while I have good news for you, um, student conduct code, the disciplinary or the disciplinary process in our office can definitely help. So right now, I just want you to take a deep breath, relax, and let me explain how the Office for Community Standards can help. Focus on this common picture. Okay. So the role of my office, so the Office for Community Standards, um, we essentially have three three roles that we serve. Um, the first, and probably which what takes up most of our time, is that we review and process reported cases of alleged violations of the student conduct code. So we receive reports from all different people across campus, off campus. So we review these reports, we decide if they're conduct code violations, and we work our process. Um, another piece that takes up a lot of our time is providing consultation with university community members about potential student misconduct. I know there's a couple of you here in the room that I've had some consultations with. Um, and I would say that takes up probably, you know, 30% of my time every week. It's just talking with faculty and uh, graduate student instructors about, um, you know, potential violations. Um, and just because you reach out to our office and we have that consultation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to submit a report. At this point, it's just a consultation. Um, and then the third thing is um, providing outreach and education to the university, um, you know, kind of like what I'm doing today. And this time of year, it's really busy for our office getting out and um, doing these kinds of presentations to different faculty and graduate students. So the, the document that really drives the work that my office does is the Board of Regents Student, student Code of Conduct. Um, and uh, this conduct code was recently revised um, and uh, readapted in June of this, of this year. So the conduct code went through several major revisions. There was lots of consultation done with different student groups, faculty groups, staff all across campus. Um, another thing to know is that the conduct code is university-wide. So it doesn't just apply to the Twin Cities campus, but it applies to all of the systems and campuses as well. And there are some sections that might be um, particularly helpful for you to know about. So here you can see um, the conduct code. The guiding principles is the first section. The guiding principles, these are just principles. These are the things that we strive to be here at the university. And you will see that the very first thing is that the university seeks an environment that promotes academic achievement and integrity, that is protective of free inquiry and that serves the educational mission of the university. So the very first guiding principle has to deal with um, academic integrity and you know the entire mission of the university. Um, another piece of the guiding principles that I want to point out is letter F. The university is dedicated to the fair and equitable resolution of conflict at the lowest level possible. So two pieces um, in that statement that I think are really important. Um, the university is dedicated to the fair and equitable resolution. Um, and we'll talk about our process and um, how we strive to make it fair and equitable. Um, and, and, and that every student has access to the process. And then also um, that we want to resolve conflict at the lowest level possible. So a lot of times things happen and people just call our office right away and want us to take care of it. But really what the university, um, okay, so really at the university, we um, want faculty and departments to really try to take care of things at the lowest level possible. So within the classrooms, within the department, and if it's still an issue or it's not being able to be resolved at that level, um, then contact our office and, and, and we're happy to help. Um, and then if I scroll 
down. Then we get into definitions. One thing that was recently um, added was um, uh, subdivision four, learning support and testing platforms. Do any of you know what this could be referring to? So it says learning support and testing platforms shall mean tools, including online tools identified by the instructor for use in a course or learning activity. Does that make sense to anyone? Is the amount of time we spend on Canvas? Yeah, so Canvas could be a learning support and testing platform. Can you think of anything that um, might be considered a learning support platform that might be kind of dubious? Could be YouTube. Yeah. Have you? Has anyone heard of Chegg or Course Hero? Yeah. So um, during the pandemic, um, student use of those kinds of websites exploded, and uh, and so did our incidents of scholastic dishonesty getting reported. What are they? Oh, what are Chegg and uh, Course Hero? Yeah. So um, there are these websites out there that. <laughs> They claim to be tutoring websites, so they claim to help students in their courses, but actually what they're doing is facilitating cheating. Um, so students can upload um, course material uh, from previous courses, so like old test exams, old papers that they've written, and then other students can have access to them. So that's mainly what Course Hero is, kind of like a file sharing website. Um, Chegg, they actually have actual people who are experts um, who are available in real time to answer questions. So when everyone was doing exams online, um, a student could during the exam time pose a question to check and get an answer within five to 10 minutes from one of their experts and basically have somebody else answer the question. So, so when we redid the conduct code, we were really trying to address some of these things uh, to let students know that these things are are not okay, especially when instructors are like, well, it's an open book, you know, you can use resources. Students are like, well, that means I can use Chegg. It's like, no, that's um, not really what open book means in this case. Yeah. I'm trying to have it in the middle of the screen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, my fire. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, maybe that's fine. Okay, great. So then we get into other definitions like plagiarism. Um, one thing I do want to mention about the definition, the university's definition of plagiarism is that there is no mention of self plagiarism in this definition. So that's something uh, that the faculty kind of went back and forth about, about whether or not to include that um, in the definition. Some um, fields of study actually encourage. Um, people to build on work that they've previously done. And so some faculty were very, um, had very strong opinions that they did not want some plagiarism defined in the university's definition of plagiarism. However, in your courses, if you do not want students to reuse material that they've previously written for other classes, you can include it in your syllabus and then the student has to abide by it. Um, okay, so then section four, prohibited behaviors. Um, so this is where we get into the different violations that um, could be reported to our office. And the very number one um, violation would be scholastic dishonesty. I also need to get away from the, the term violation. So in the redoing of the conduct code, we changed some of our language, which is I'm taking a some time to get used to, but instead of violations, we are calling um, things uh, prohibited behaviors. And instead of sanctions, we're calling them outcomes. So if I use the term violation, I'm still trying to get used to the new language. Yeah. Yep. 
instead of saying what you're saying happens. So instead of saying sanction, oh. um, so you know, at the end of a of a case, the student might get an outcome, which we would previously call it a sanction. Okay. So trying to get away from some of that um, overly negative uh, language. Um, so scholastic dishonesty, and here you can see that we included the um, information about that it's not okay to include the posting of student generated work or coursework on, on online learning support and testing platforms, not approved for the specific course in question. So it's not saying that students can't ever post things, but it, it has to have faculty approval and for the, the website, the platforms that faculty say are okay. Um, so this that's probably the number one uh, violation that we see in our office is um, violations of scholastic dishonesty. We also see violation of university rules. So this could be other things that you outline in your syllabi, um, such as self plagiarism. In some lab classes, they might have rules around how to take care of lab equipment. Um, and so a student could be held accountable for violating university rules if um, you know that behavior is noticed. Um, so other things, I mean, this is just kind of typical things that I wanted to point out to you is something new that's been added is subdivision seven discriminatory harassment. Um, so this is something that was recently added. There is a very high bar um, in order to uh, be held accountable for this subdivision. Um, so it has to go beyond free speech and really be directed at um, an individual and it has to be severe, persistent, pervasive, and really limit a person's um, ability to engage and participate in a university program or activity. Um, let me see if there's anything. Else, you might in your classes encounter falsification. Um, usually, this happens more um, at, at the admissions level or even the undergraduate level. Students uh, saying that they have credentials that potentially they don't in order to get access to a course. Um, and then disruptive behavior, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit um, about that as well. Just yeah. I wonder if it's really up to um, faculty to make students aware in their syllabi in terms of around plagiarism because I don't know how many students will go to those students. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, yeah. If it's pretty extensive to mm -hmm. uh, process a, an area where we can do a little bit more education for our students so that it's really part of the syllabus. Yes, yes. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that, about what faculty can do. And I think that's the number one thing is going through your syllabus um, carefully and not just on the first day of class, but coming back to it um, and, and talking about it often. Question. Yeah. Uh, could you please repeat the questions in the room? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Rhonda um, was asking or basically making a comment um, about the importance of uh, faculty uh, talking in their syllabus and in their classes about um, expectations. So another document that is really helpful as an instructor. Um, it's going to be this administrative policy on teaching and learning instructor and unit responsibilities. Okay. So how many of you have seen this policy it's in the policy library and it really outlines the responsibilities of instructors and faculty. Um, and so it goes under, you know, you need to provide course information, providing students with access and feedback, 
annuating exams. Um, so the two that um, that I want to point out is letters F and G, reporting scholastic dishonesty and maintaining an appropriate learning environment. So many instructors and faculty are surprised to learn that it's actually a policy that you report incidents of scholastic dishonesty when you encounter them. And we'll talk um, about the many reasons why uh, that's important, but it is actually um, a policy. Um, and then maintaining an appropriate learning environment. So, um, you know, uh, if you have a disruptive student, taking care that, that you address any problematic behavior um, in the classroom. Um, and so sometimes we find that faculty just contact can't contact us right away and say, hey, the student just keeps learning out answers or um, is very rude in class. Um, and so we can coach the faculty in how to have those initial conversations with the student themselves um, instead of we, we hesitate to just use the conduct code and the conduct process for, for everything. We want to try to resolve it at that lowest level possible. Yes, Ruby. Katie, um, yeah. when it is reported to you, mm -hmm. do you do anything with it behind the scenes? So, for example, the coaching is incredibly helpful. Uh -huh. um, but is there any record keeping that you do? No, no. For consultations, we so just in order to um, justify my time, I might say you know who I met with and for how long and just generally what it was about. Um, but that's more for us to keep track of how many minutes every week that we're doing in consultation. Because to me, the term report means like this is a formal process. If I contact Katie, the student is gonna like it's gonna be in their permanent record. Yeah. But permanent mm -hmm. record when in fact it's just a consult. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So for those of you online, um, Ruby was just asking about um, if a faculty member contacts our office, you know, does that result in a report? And at that point, it's just a consult. Um, we we don't do anything with it. Um, if it's really concerning, we might follow up and just say, hey, how did that turn out? Um, but yeah, we're not going to do anything unless we get a formal report. And there's um, a report on our website that you would fill out um, to do that. Yeah, so there's two different things you're talking about right now. One is F, which we're required to do. Yes. And that is a report. And that's Becomes a part of the record, and then there's the other piece that Ruby's asking about, which is just the conversation. Yes. Okay. Yep. So um, the question was about the difference between F and G. F is the formal report um, that, yeah, that if you encounter it and you determine that it's more likely than not that scholastic dishonesty occurred, then you are obligated to report. However, you might not be sure, or you might not know how to approach the student. And you want to contact our office and do a consult. So, um, so that would not result or result in a formal report with it being on the student's record. Yeah. And we can talk a little bit more about you know what a record actually is and, and how that impacts um, students. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about scholastic dishonesty. I am very passionate about uh, academic integrity. And I wouldn't be doing this work if I wasn't. So, yeah. But you also have to find a little bit of humor, too, um, in the work that we do. So these are some of the rationalizations that we've heard in our office throughout the years for why students um, engage in change. So everyone, there's this perception that everyone else is doing it, so that if the student doesn't do it, then they are falling behind. Um, the professor doesn't care if I cheat. The course is just an elective and not required. We hear this a lot with undergrads doing their generals. Um, I have additional academic aspirations, um, so there's a lot of pressure to do well in these um, courses. My friend asked me to help them. We see this at all levels, undergraduate, graduate students. Um, it's really hard to say no to a friend um, when, they, when they ask you for help. And sometimes you may start helping them with the best of intentions.
actions, and then that line gets crossed, uh, whereas you're actually doing more of the work than the front is. If I fail, I will disappoint my family. Um, there are a lot of students who, um, you know, might be coming from, um, you know, a different country and their families are spending a lot of money to send them here or their countries are spending a lot of money for them to get an education here. And so there's a lot of pressure and not just with international students, but, um, you know, domestic students as well who, um, you know, feel like family members will be disappointed. I did a during undergrad and was never caught. Um, busy with other life commitments. I think for graduate students, this is especially true. Um, graduate students have a lot going on in their lives, um, not just school. And I didn't understand the material. I was desperate. Katie, can I just add, yeah. I'm teaching the undergraduates. Yeah. It really does seem like it is a, a systematic life uh, rationale. So it's not just that they did it during their undergraduate. The undergraduates say, I did it in high school. Yes. This is a behavior I had in high school. Yes. So it, I, I see that a lot with, um, um, for lack of a better term, simple plagiarism, like mm -hmm. taking something directly from an article, putting it into their presentation. They say, well, I did it in high school. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is at multiple layers. Yes. So Ruby was just pointing out that this often starts back in high school with students developing poor habits. Um, and maybe not learning, or or maybe it's intentional. Um, we don't really know. There's some research out there. Um, uh, Don Gehring, he's kind of a pioneer in the research regarding scholastic dishonesty. Um, and one of his studies uh, that's been replicated um, shows that 90% of high school students have admitted to, to cheating in some form, uh, whether that's plagiarism, cheating on an exam, during high school. Um, at the undergraduate level, uh, it shows that you know about 50 to 60 percent of undergrads have admitted to cheating at least once um, during their undergraduate time. So um, we, our office is only seeing the smallest numbers um, and we know it's such a more pervasive problem. Yeah, question. I'm not to be double advocate here, yeah. but um... And not to remove uh, or place ownership or responsibility away from the students. But I'd almost want to flip that and say that, um, like, high school and, and undergrad, like, the structures that they were in facilitated these behaviors, right? Because it's not just the student, right? And, and it's not just um i think a lot of times it's not their motivation to cheat but this is a behavior or a habit that wasn't taught um is a form of cheating right and here's how to take you know a, a excerpt from an article and translate it into your own words mm -hmm. or to cite it so yeah. I just want to like kind of even the balance yeah. a little bit in terms of um, the, the how much emphasis is placed on the student and recognizing that students come out of system. Yes, and I completely agree with that. Um, so many times in our office, we you know students um, not intentionally um, commit plagiarism. And the conduct code doesn't um, say anything about intentionality. So either it happened or it didn't, right? And so um, we oftentimes have conversations with students about, I know you did not intentionally do this. I can tell that you, you are really struggling with this. And let's help connect you with some resources to, um, to help you learn how to do it, to do it properly. So other factors that might contribute to scholastic dishonesty, um, students being unmotivated or underprepared. Um, so again, maybe going back to their high school English class, didn't really talk um, about uh, proper citations, or um, maybe they were in a quantitative major in, in undergrad and they haven't written um, academically in a while. Um, 
so there might be core time management skills that they got, you know, that worked for them in undergrad, they were able to finish. Um, but in graduate school, it, it's, a, it's a different level. Uh, that lack of skill and citation, um, lack of ethical decision making skills, and then just differences in educational backgrounds. Um, getting back to that point of you know, different high schools, different colleges might have different uh, ways that they prepare students, and it might not all be the same. Okay. So why should you report scholastic dishonesty? So beyond that first bullet point where instructors are required to report, but beyond that, um, it's important that we hold students accountable. So um, the university has student learning outcomes and they also have student development outcomes. And one of the student development outcomes is that students will um, learn responsibility and accountability. And one way that we can help students do that is by holding them accountable when we encounter these violations. Um, so we want to maintain fairness for all students. It's not fair to other students if we don't do anything about um, scholastic dishonesty. And then reports of scholastic dishonesty need to have a central repository. And that's where my office comes in. So we are the central repository. So our office keeps track of if this is happening in other classes uh, for the same student. So you might not know that this student is also doing these same things in another class. Um, and so if you don't report, the, the student just um, digs themselves a hole and we can't get them the support and the resources uh, that they need. I've also seen many times where faculty write in their report, the student told me this is the first time that they've ever done this. They've never done this before. Um, but I know that I have two or three other reports from other faculty. So I'm not saying that students, you know, might not be telling the truth, but it's just, it's important that we have that, that central repository to aid in student development and learning, and then also upholding the integrity and value of a University of Minnesota degree. Yeah, a couple of us here are doctoral students who uh -huh. will be teaching either in our program, in their program, or afterward. Yeah. Could you define to us what the university means by instructors? Yeah. In reporting system, if the TA is the one who identifies something. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's going to look different um, department to department and even class to class. So, if you're a graduate instructor and you're a TA and there is a faculty of record for that course. Have a conversation with that faculty member about how you want to approach um, incidents of scholastic dishonesty when you um, when you find them. Does the faculty member of record want to be the one that's reporting, or are they okay with you reporting, making a report to our office? So I think it's just going to be something that needs to be decided between um, the TA and the faculty of record. Uh, so yeah, and then upholding the integrity and value of a University of Minnesota degree. If we didn't do anything about scholastic dishonesty, a, a degree would uh, become meaningless from the university. So we want to uphold um, that integrity. I also just want to divert a little bit um, about the term scholastic dishonesty. I really hate the term dishonesty because in my meetings with students, so many of them are not trying to be dishonest. Um, dishonest has a connotation of it's um, something intentional that a student is doing. It's almost like a personal value. Um, I don't know if we just have, I don't know a better word <laughs> to do it, maybe misconduct. Yeah, Evan. Um, just going back to the last point too, but for instructors, that would include staff instructors if they're the instructors. Yeah, right? yeah anyone, anyone who, um, is teaching the course. So that can be adjunct, uh, graduate, or uh, you know, faculty, graduate student, faculty, yeah, anyone of record. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a really good question in the chat from Katie White about how much evidence you need in order to report. Oh, for sure. So yeah. I think I think that that's actually a very big question. Yeah. I don't think very many people are aware of what is the bar for reporting? And then yeah. also, what happens to 
that student? Is that become a part of their transcript that something was reported? Yeah. Is that something that they are made aware of that the yeah. report was made? Like, yeah. You know, both pieces of that. What is the bar? And then yeah. what happens next? For the yeah. 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 So I was I was thinking it was the next slide, but it's not. So I I will address it now. Um, so what is the bar to report um, scholastic dishonesty? So the standard of proof that the university has adopted um, for all violations is preponderance of the evidence. So which means, is it more likely than not that the violation happened? So you, when you look at the evidence, you just need to believe that it's more likely than not that it happened. Yeah, there might be some other reasons, but the most likely explanation is that the student did this. Um, so that would be the standard of proof um was there a second piece to the question what oh oh the record right what happens to the record so so our office we have a separate record keeping system from the rest of campus so when a student has a disciplinary violation that information is only kept in our office um and we do not share that information with anyone outside of the university unless we get the student's written permission there is nothing on a student's transcript unless the student is suspended or expelled. Um, and uh, if the student does give us permission to share the information with an outside entity, let's say like an employer to do a background check, um, and we have the student's permission, we only share out disciplinary information and we only share out exactly what the student has given us permission to share about the incident. After seven years, it completely gets expunged. We are we are also working, and it's almost completed, on an early expungement process that students can request through our office. So before the seven years is up, um, it's been at least, I think, two semesters since the incident happened. Not for incidents of scholastic dishonesty, and I'll talk about why that's different, um, but for other things students can read can request an early expungement. Yeah. So I want to follow up a little bit on the first part of the question related yeah. to what Kate White said. So I understand that the standard is a preponderance of evidence, yeah. which was actually, um, you know, that's pretty harsh as far as the student goes. So that's, that's the standard. Yeah, it's a pretty low standard. That's a yeah. pretty low standard. Yeah. Now, what if it's just a little teeny tiny bit of plagiarism? Like so, like yeah. so how like I understand the evidence standard. Yeah. So what is the sort of badness standard? How sure. bad of a thing do you want to hear? Yeah. About? Yeah, that's a great question. Um I'd like to follow up. Sure. I, it might be related to what Rachel is asking. Um, so let's say 75% of my students don't seem to understand citations. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm going through papers, I'm like, yeah. I'm these errors, finding, you know, like it, it really seems clear that they don't know what they're doing. And we talked about this a little bit, right? Yeah. But they're not learning this anymore. And so am I reporting 75% of my class? No, no. I feel like no. there's no. Yeah. Yeah. Of, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Me, like, sure. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So a minor bit of plagiarism. So we're talking, maybe they forgot to cite like a sentence or something or a quotation marks or something. Is that kind of like what you would consider minor plagiarism? Let's say for one answer on a homework, they copy three sentences from the textbook and drop oh, it sure. into a short answer. So yeah. it's just the homework. It's yeah. just one question. Yeah. It's the first time they did it. Yeah. So if you are at all going to academically sanction the student, so like lower their grade, not pay the points on that question, um, then yes, you would have to report it. So if I give them a zero point for that question, you would want me to report that that happened. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, because the student has a due process, which is a legal right. Even for something that minor, the student has the legal right to disagree. Um, now, if you wanted to use it as a learning experience, say, hey, I noticed you did this. I'm not going to dock you for it this time, but if it happens again, um, I'm going to have to give you zero points and make a report. 
So that's my question though, because your first bullet point says instructors are required to report. I should say required to report if you are at all going to sanction the student. Okay, I'm going to take points off. Or yeah. That yeah. So now with Jennifer's, because um, like citations are part of the requirement for the yes. assignment, and I tell them. But if you want to use it as a learning opportunity for everyone and give everyone a chance to redo it, you you could do that. So you want to make sure that you're giving the student the same. Um, like if you're going to allow one student to redo something, you have to allow other students in the same situation, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say if 75% of the students are not getting it, I, I would use it as a learning opportunity and allow them to fix. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, but that is completely up to the instructor. Right. Yep, that is completely. Up. And if we're talking seventy students, it's not. Yeah, yeah, so I'm used to do so. so yeah. I'm gonna rethink that. Yeah. Um, the spring, spring of twenty twenty, I had a case in Carlson School where like fifty out of seventy students on a final exam used check, and all fifty students got. It got reported and that was a huge thing for the instructor to have to go through so i i get that it's time consuming and, and not fun so um so just kind of quickly want to go through this promoting academic integrity um you know reviewing your syllabus throughout the semester um there is a required uh syllabus insertion regarding scholastic dishonesty um, and then just if you can change your exams routinely, reorder questions, um, change prompts for papers, and then uh, proctor exams carefully. Um, and then Evan, can you share out this presentation after? Okay, so different signs of plagiarism that I'm sure you are familiar with, you know what to look for. Uh, Signs of unauthorized collaboration, which is another form of scholastic dishonesty. And then ideas for verifying scholastic dishonesty. So if you're if you have, suspect something might be going on, but you're not exactly sure, um, you know, you might want to Google a sentence or phrase that seems out of place, see if it comes, has any hits anywhere online. Um, ask a colleague to review the assignment or exam. Um, you know, take the student's name off <laughs> uh, first to protect the student's privacy. Um, you can use online plagiarism checkers such as Turnitin. The university has a um, has an agreement with Turnitin, and you can build it right into your Canvas site. Look for your course materials online. If you haven't already got the Course Hero, um, I would encourage you to go to Course Hero and look for uh, if you have any materials out there. Uh, my husband teaches, for you guys know, uh, um, and I was telling him about it, and he's like, well, I wonder if any of my stuff is out there. And yes, he had stuff on Course Hero for his classes. So, I mean, it's even graduate students that are, that are putting stuff out there. Um, and then discuss your concerns with the student and show them the evidence for your concerns. Sure. There are definitely, I mean, I, I check course zero every so often for courses in our division. And there's yeah. stuff from courses in our division. Yeah. And, our and it is so hard. It's not very good stuff. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I mean, I see them and I'm like, yeah. Like, yeah. But like, um, but yeah, there are graduates who are doing it. Yes. And it is really hard to request to get those materials removed. Um, yeah, we, I could go on for days about that, but. So then um, addressing scholastic dishonesty. So I think you all are probably interested in, in this. So your first step is going to be to gather that information and evidence. So I think that there is a big misconception out there that my office, that we make the decision. Yes, the student violated the conduct code. That's true for everything except scholastic dishonesty cases. Um, so we rely on the expert, which is you all, to tell us um, if it's more likely than not that the student violated the conduct code. Because there's no way that me or my director can be an expert on everything here at the university. So that's why we rely on you to tell us. 
So you want to gather that information and evidence, and maybe you still haven't even made a decision yet, right? So then you're going to want to meet with the student if at all possible, just to have a conversation. Hear from the student, you know, say, hey, I'm a little concerned, or I, I want to talk about your process for writing this paper. Can you walk me through it? And listen to the student. And then show them the evidence that you have and say, Here, here's what I found on a website, and it looks like this was copied and pasted. Nine times out of 10, the student is going to say, yes, I did it, right? Um, so then you need to decide if, if it rises to the level of scholastic dishonesty. If you still feel like it is more likely than not that scholastic dishonesty occurred, whether it is intentional or not intentional. And then what academic penalty to assign? Our website has some sanctioning guidelines, which we are in the process of updating. So if this is the first time you've encountered it, um, you know, encountered a violation, you can look at our sanctioning guidelines to, to see what an appropriate sanction might be. What we tell faculty is that you want to be, you need to be consistent in your own practice. So if you are giving us, if you're failing a student for the course, if another student commits a similar violation, that student should also fail the course. So you don't want to be giving different um, sanctions or different outcomes um, for similar violations. However, Ruby's, uh, let's say that there's a similar violation in Ruby's class and Jennifer's class. They might decide on different sanctions and that is okay. Um, so Ruby might fail the student in the class. Jennifer, <laughs> you know, Jennifer might just give a zero on the paper and that is okay as long as that is their own individual practice. Okay. So then you want to inform the student of your decision and then fill out the report on our website. Any questions about these steps? Yeah, so it basically <laughs> seems that your office is the repository for exactly. the work and it's yep. a lot of the really burden our responsibilities on the faculty member uh, to and investigate and uh, so that's that, that's 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 a big it is a big <laughs> ask yeah yeah it is it is a lot um where our office comes into play in these types of cases is that then our role is to give students their due process so we um get a chance to meet with the student hear from their perspective about what happened if the student disagrees, then we afford them a process by which they can disagree with the instructor. It was a comment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, was there a comment? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, with everything, yeah. Um, another set of tools is with Canvas. I had a case in an online course where we used information from the time stamp with the student accounts both in files and on the website to show which of to show which of two students looked at the other student's work and then uploaded nearly identical and identically correct materials to the shared space, thereby giving strong evidence of plagiarism. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So use whatever evidence you have at your disposal. And that might be looking at timestamps, getting Canvas logs, um, anything. And, and we can help with that too, like connect you to uh, the Canvas team uh, at the university. Um, so we can we can help too. So then what happens in our office after a report is submitted? We get the report, we read through it. Um, if we have any questions about the report, um, we'll contact you and get um, some clarification. Um, and then we send a charge letter to the student um, that just says, hey, we received this report. If this report is true, it would be a violation of this subdivision. You need to come in and, and meet with us. Um, so then we meet with them. Um, and in most, most cases, it's just that meeting. They accept the instructor's uh, outcome and then the case is closed. Our office can add on additional sanctions depending on the severity of the violation, or if it's not the student's first time um, committing scholastic dishonesty. So we might require the student to go to the writing center or um, you know, to do some extra work around whatever it is that, that they've been uh, reported for. 
The student also has the option of accepting the informal resolution, which would be the outcome decided by the instructor, or requesting a formal resolution, which is a hearing. And I know that sounds scary, um, a hearing, um, but that's where my office comes in. I kind of take over the case at that point, um, and I present at the hearing on behalf of the university, and the, the reporting party would be my witness. So we would work together um, to do that, but the major, most of the work is on me at that point. Um, I also want to let you know that very few cases ever go to a hearing. Like last semester, I had one. Um, so we try our very hardest to, to get to that informal resolution. Um, so then quickly, here's just kind of a flow chart of uh, reporting scholastic dishonesty to our office. Sometimes a student will get a letter with the resolution and we don't require them to come in. So if it's clear from your report that you had a really good developmental conversation with the, with the student um, and the student totally gets it and they told you that they accept your decision, we won't require that the student meets with us. Um, we'll just send them the letter and say, if you disagree, contact us. But most times, um, you know, students will have to meet with us and then they can either accept responsibility or request a hearing. Um, if the student accepts responsibility and it's their first time being reported to our office, they are eligible for the Academic Integrity Matters Program, we call it AIM uh, for short. And if they successfully complete this program, we will change their record to non-disciplinary, um, you know, after they complete it. And then upon graduation, um, they can request us to just completely expunge the record right when they graduate. So, yeah, did you have a question? About direct, like, expunging the record. Yeah. Uh, like, like, why does it matter in, in the sense that, like, do employers find out about this? Is it, like, is it on their transcript or does somebody have it's not, like Yeah, it's not on the transcript um, unless the student is suspended or expelled. Um, but yes, there are some, um, there are some employers that do background checks and this might come up in a background check. So especially like if you want jobs with the government, um, they often do background checks and, and contact our office. Okay, so they they in the, in the background check they like are savvy enough to so like they specifically ask for this, or or how does it come up? Yeah, it, every background check is different, and we will only give the information that is asked for. So if they're not asking for academic. We're not reporting academic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I did just do one for a former student. Um, he went, uh, background check for the Department of Defense. And they did ask me if I was aware of any academic discipline or sanctions on that person. So it was part of the report. And no, to be fair, if they'd given it to me and I had no idea, I would have to say I'm not aware of any. <laughs> so it would, I suppose it would depend on the audit. But they do ask those questions. Okay, so just what happens in our meeting, you can read through this, but basically we are providing students with their due process. Um, students have rights. Um, this is very important. Um, the student has the right to keep attending class until the case is officially resolved. Even if you are going to give the student an F in the course, um, until it is closed and done, the student can keep attending. So if the student has requested a hearing, the student has the right to keep attending class. Um, also, university policy prohibits students from withdrawing from a class if you are going to give them a final grade of F due to scholastic dishonesty. If you're just gonna give them a zero on a paper, they can withdraw. Yes, yes, okay. yeah. So there's been a lot of controversy around that policy, but um, yeah, the university policy is that, um, I just misunderstood it. I, I thought it was if they weren't under investigation at all, they could drop the course. But it is only if it's only if they're going to if you're going to award them a final grade of F. Now, some colleges, so like if the School of Public Health wanted a more stringent policy, you could do that. Like, um, you know, if a student can't withdraw to avoid any grade sanction, 
Um, you could do that. Yeah. So our academic integrity match program, I run this program. It allows students um, to go through a restorative justice program, and then the record is changed to not disciplinary. If you want more information about this, I'm really happy to uh, tell you about it. Graduate students are eligible. Um, however, it, it has the incident has to be limited to a single course. So recently I had um, a report come through about a student um, cheating during a uh, written exam, like for their PhD. So that is pretty egregious violation for the university. And so we would not allow the student to do, to do the AIM program. Um, I'm going to skip disruptive students because it sounds like that's, I mean, if you have disruptive students, please contact, please contact me um, or our office, but it sounds like scholastic dishonesty is more of the, um, uh, more of the issue here. So I do have some scenarios, but I'm wondering, uh, it looks like we might have a couple minutes left. I'm happy to stay longer, um, but if, maybe I should open up to questions instead of the scenario. So are there questions? And Katie, we'd love to have you back to run through some of them. Yeah, I'd be more than happy. Yeah, if we want to do another session that's just completely scenarios, walking through scenarios, that would be fine. Yeah. The last comment I see is from Dr. Oh, OK. So any other questions? I was just curious in terms of some of the sources that students are using. Um, what is it, the CERO you mentioned? Uh, how, so how can you detect that you're using these sources? Um, so sometimes, so Rhonda asked how faculty can detect that students are using something from like Course Hero. Yeah. Um, so Course Hero is going to be like previous coursework that students upload. So let's say that um, you're grading a paper and it seems like it's answering a question that was prompted in last year's version of the course. And then you go on Course Hero and see that it's like word for word. Um, so that would be that, or sometimes it's just doing a Google search or you use Turnitin. Because so do all of you use Turnitin or no? No, you know what it is. It's like a plagiarism checker. You can run it through Canvas um, and require that students submit their uh, papers through Turnitin. Um, and then at, you know, when it gets run through Turnitin, you get a report and it says like how many, how much of the paper matches other sources. That doesn't just, if you get a paper that has like a 60% match, that doesn't necessarily mean that the paper was copied you know, 60% of the paper was copied from other sources because if the students are using quotation marks and accurately citing, it's going to pull that. So you have to go in with a more fine tooth comb. Um, but, it, but it is a tool. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for attending, and we'll have maybe a part two. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Katie.